Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. I'm so glad you're with me today as we study 1 Nephi chapter 16 to 22. I hope this video doesn't end up a little too long, but as my preparation, there were a couple of these chapters where I just like, oh, this is delightful because it was the words of Isaiah and I love Isaiah. But well, let's just get going. Chapter 16, let's start off with verse 9. It came to pass, the voice of the Lord spake unto my father by night and commanded him on the morrow he should take his journey into the wilderness. And he gets up the next morning. Outside his tent is the Liahona. Here are just a few things, phrases about the Liahona. Chapter 16, verse 10. Came to pass, my father rose in the morning. He went forth to the tent door. To his great astonishment, he beheld upon the ground a round ball of, and I love that, curious. For me, it's kind of like, oh, curiosity. And I went to the 1828 Webster Dictionary. This is the vocabulary and the meanings of words that would be used when Joseph Smith is translating the Book of Mormon. And curious was, yeah, like curious, like a cat kind of a phrase. But there's one that stu stood out to me. This definition of curious, wrought with care and art, elegant, neat, finished, as a curious girdle. And I love that kind of curious work because it's used Old Testament, Exodus chapter 28 and 30, where this is how you're describing things that were associated with the high priest. It's, it's of God. It's directing towards God. It is symbolic of our path back to God. So, I like that. So, another, uh, just an aspect of the, the Liahona. And within the ball were two spindles, verse 10, and one pointed the way, whether we should go. So, first aspect points the way. Skipping down to verse 16 of chapter 16, we to follow the direction of the ball, which led us into the more fertile parts of the wilderness. It's not just it's leading us in the wilderness, but it's to the more fertile parts. We'll come back to some symbolism here in just a minute. Skipping down to verse 26, came to pass the voice of the Lord said unto him, look upon the ball and behold the things which are written. So all of a sudden you get this ball, which now has kind of a, you know, like you have got this little LED on there and you got words coming on. Came to pass, verse 27, my father beheld the things were written upon the ball. He did fear and tremble exceedingly. Also my brethren, sons of Ishmael and our wives. Came to pass, I, Nephi, beheld the pointers which were in the ball that they did. Now, another characteristic of the, the Liahona. They worked according to our faith and our diligence. And the heed, the attention that we're giving to the directors. If it's going to lead us in the more narrow or more fertile paths, are we paying attention to it? Are we letting it be our guide? Or are we going, yeah, that's way, but this way over here seems a little easier. I'll just ignore the directions of the of the Liahona and just go in my own way. Verse 29, and there's also written upon them a new writing. And I like that. It's not just old, but we kind of got this idea of revelation today for right now. It was plain to read. Gave us understanding concerning the ways of the Lord. It was written and changed from time to time. Probably should have underlined that in red, changed from time to time, according to the faith and diligence which we gave it. And thus we see that by small means, the Lord can bring about great things. I have found in my life that sources of direction from the, war, from the Lord work according to the faith, diligence, and the heed that we give to them. Now, there's a couple of comparisons I want to make. And, and one is the one that's been made for quite a while. It's, it's a Liahona. And President Thomas S. Monson, when he was a counselor in the First Presidency, gave just a brilliant talk about patriarchal blessings and compared them to Liahonas, uh, a Liahona of light. One of the things he said in that talk was, The same Lord who provided a Liahona for Lehi provides for you and me today a rare and valuable gift. Give direction to our lives. To mark the hazards of our safety, to chart the way, even safe passage, not to a promised land, but to our heavenly home. The gift to which I refer to is known as your patriarchal blessing. And there are a couple of their talks that talk about patriarchal blessings. And, and recently there have been some that are like talking about, hey, what about the timing? When should I get the timing? And let me just give you a few other quotes on patriarchal blessings and you know, kind of get a flavor. This one is when title of this talk is When to Receive Your Patriarchal Blessing. It's in May 2023 in the Liahona. Your patriarchal blessing is a message from your Heavenly Father and will likely include promises and inspired counsel to guide you throughout your life. A patriarchal blessing is not going to map out your life or answer all your questions. If it doesn't mention an important life event, 
do not take it to mean you won't have that opportunity. Likewise, there's no guarantee that everything in your blessing will come to pass in this life. A patriarchal blessing is eternal, and if you live worthy, the promises that are not fulfilled in this life will be granted in the next. And he also said, um, wait, and I'm skipping, going to Elder uh, Bennett. Now, this the title of this talk, uh, also from Leahona, May 2023, is Your Patriarchal Blessing Inspired Direction from Heavenly Father. Elder Randall K. Bennett said, Cherishing my patriarchal blessing while I was young blessed me with courage when I was discouraged, comfort when I was fearful, peace when I felt anxious, hope when I felt hopeless, joy when I needed it most. My patriarchal blessing helped me increase my faith and trust my Heavenly Father and my Savior. It also increased my love for them, and it still does. Patriarchal blessings will uh, often include or include the a declaration of lineage, or say what tribe we're from. And I just add this quote um, from Gospel Topics, where it explains patriarchal blessings and lineages. It reads, quote, A patriarchal blessing includes a declaration of lineage, stating of the, that the person is of the house of Israel, a descendant of Abraham, belonging to a specific tribe of Jacob. Many Latter-day Saints are of the tribe of Ephraim, the tribe given the primary responsibility to lead the Latter-day work of, this, of the Lord. Because each of us has many bloodlines running in us, two members of the same family need be, may be declared as being different tribes in Israel. It does not matter if a person's lineage in the house of Israel is through bloodlines or by adoption. Church members are counted as a descendant of Abraham and an heir to all the promises and blessings contained in the Abrahamic covenant. Let me just add another thought or another kind of application of, a, of the Leahona. I, you know, I, I go by, okay, it's directing us in life. And I think, well, what directs me in life? And you can probably say I just flipped ahead of the slide, but it's for me, it's a lot like that little map program I use on my phone. And if I need to go somewhere, boy, it just helps me go there and it gives me a direct route and if i get a little bit off it's like recalculating recalculating and then hey here we go and i love that kind of analogy because for lehi this would be an amazing technology it would be new to him it would be giving him that direction and maybe there's a, a way to apply a liahona to technology in our lives they lehi and his family used this new technology, Leahona, to guide them in the more fertile past, the way to God. It gave them direction. It, sometimes it was new to them, and it changed. And I think, what about technology? How are we, or how could we use the tech that's in our hand to help us draw closer to God, closer to your life's desired destination? Elder Ridd gave this great advice. You are growing up with one of the greatest tools for good in the history of humanity, the internet. With it comes an elaborate buffet of choices. With the click of a button, you can access whatever your heart desires. And that's the key. What does your heart desire? What do you gravitate toward? Where will your desires lead? Just like with Lehi and the Leahona, and Nephi is telling us, hey, if we gave heed, attention to the Leahona, the direction it was taking us, it was the more fertile way in our wilderness. And maybe that's that's a, a parallel to me with technology. It can, if my heart's desire is on righteousness, lead me. If I'm giving heed to the words, the Lord, word of the Lord, it can direct me and be an aid to help me along the path. But really, the time to take charge of technology is today for all of us. Yeah, and maybe it's just kind of this idea, if I'm teaching youth, I may just stop and say, let's think about how we're using daily technology. What are we using it for? And I don't know if you've ever done it. You, know, you do the little reports. Hey, how, do, how long am I taking on what parts or which apps? And you can do it from iOS or do it for Android. And just kind of see hey, where are you spending your time? And really, in what ways are my choices with technology leading me closer to the Lord? Am I making choices that lead him away? How is this a tool and not a master for me? Well, back to our our uh, travels. 
backing up, they they leave First Nephi chapter two, depart in the wilderness. You can kind of see like this is just a, a little bit of a map. You're by the borders of the Red Sea. Nephi reports we're heading in a direction. Verse five, we get to the borders which are near the Red Sea. Chapter sixteen, we took our tents and we departed to the wilderness and traveled nearly in a south south east direction. And there are people who have done great, great maps and uh, and just talked about, hey, here's possible tra- routes. And I, I know Nephi's going to talk about, hey, we head directly east here in a little bit. But he does get to a place where it is important that they have food. Well, it's important all the way through, through the uh, travel. And he breaks his bow. Chapter 16, verse 18, came to pass that I, Nephi, went forth to slay food. Behold, I'd break my bow, which is a fine steel. And I've always just wondered, and this is just me, man, you got to be pretty powerful to break a steel bow. Okay, got to have some strength. Okay, and no one's happy. There's no food. Verse 19, and they're hungry. Verse 20, came to pass Laman and Lemuel, of course, their reaction is to murmur exceedingly. And they are suffering. But isn't it? Interesting that Laman and Lemuel have all these great things, but their reaction is not, let's look for a solution, but let's complain. I love Elder Maxwell's tie-in to this. There was murmuring, too, because Nephi broke his steel bow, and also because he couldn't possibly build a ship. Those same murmurers, insensitive to their inconsistency, quickly surfeited themselves on the meat brought back by Nephi's new bow. They also sailed successfully over the vast oceans to a new hemisphere hemisphere, in the ship that Nephi couldn't build. Strange, isn't it? How those with the longest lists of new demands also have the shortest memories of past blessings. I love that just that idea. If you want a cure for murmuring, maybe it is remembering the blessings the Lord's given you, the timing where his hand has been in our life instead of the demands in my list of today, what I want. Well, they go into the wilderness, chapter verse 16, verse 34, came to pass that Ishmael died and was buried in the place which was called Nahum. They don't call it Nahum. It is already called Nahum. And uh, this is just, a, uh, just an insight from Hugh Nibley where he said, when Ishmael died on the journey, he was buried in the place which was called Nahum. Note, this is not a place which we called Nahum, but the place which was so called a desert burial ground. Jawson reports that the, though Bedouins sometimes bury their dead where they die, may, many carry the remains great distances to bury them. The Arabic root, and I don't know, this is NHM, has the basic meaning of to sigh or moan, and occurs nearly always in the third form, the sigh or moan of another. The Hebrew Nahum, or comfort, is related. But that is not in the form given in the Book of Mormon. At this point, place, we are told the daughters of Ishmael did mourn exceedingly and are reminded that among the desert Arabs, mourning rites are a monopoly of the women. But I go, I'll go back to, to Nephi, just, just lessons. Um, this is a difficult time. There is mourning. And then I look back at what, what the Lord's taught them through their actions and the symbols. We're going through difficult times. The Lord's going to help us, whether it's through maybe technology today, may, uh, Leahona, patriarchal blessings, our own efforts going out and making a new bowl. If we put forth our effort and seek the Lord's direction, he will help us through our difficulties. Chapter 17, verse 1, they take their journey and they're going to travel nearly eastward. And I look at it and go, holy cow, that is such a long uh and just difficult journey. I, I look at the satellite photo and just I'm amazed. So I understand just a, just maybe just intellectually, but not experientially, what Nephi says. And we did travel and wade through much affliction in the wilderness. That'd be tough to go through that. But now skipping ahead to chapter verse four, we did sojourns for the space of many years, even eight years in the wilderness. And we came to pass to the land which we called Bountiful because of its much fruit and wild honey. And all those things were prepared to the Lord that we might not perish. And we beheld the sea, which we called Erantium, which, being interpreted, is many waters. And you know the story. They build a ship. I'm not going to focus much on the building of the ship and the complaining and the voyage there. But let me just make kind of a summary overall thing. And 
I see the hand of the Lord in Laman and Lemuel's life. And you can see it, how it's growing, and sometimes maybe you leave them a little more powerful, but it's different. I see the hand of the Lord just trying to reach out to Laman and Lemuel every time a little bit differently. Let me see if I can get your attention. Let me bring you back to me. So you get earlier on, Father Lehi, I'm giving you a testimony. Laman and Lemuel, pay attention. They don't, you get an angel visit. I don't know that the angel affects them much. Chapter 7, you have righteous women pleading with Laman and Lemuel, and it makes a difference. There's power in the pleading of a white righteous woman or righteous man. In chapter 16, you know, there's this idea of individual revelation. You need to get individual revelation. If you're going to withstand all these difficulties, you have to have individual revelation in your life, Laman and Lemuel. And then when they're on, on the boat, the storm comes up. We got Nephi tied up. It is a, a storm. It's a natural disaster. It, it's a cal calamity. And that I see once again, Laman, Laman and Lemuel is having this experience. The Lord says, let me give you maybe a storm, a really big difficulty. Can I get your attention now? Will you pay attention to me now? But there's also a point in Laman and Lemuel's life where it stops being effective. You know, in chapter 18, when they're on the ship, what Father Lehi says no longer works or helps. It's like, we don't care. I don't have another example of the angel not visiting. Or, okay, but that just doesn't happen. But but you look, uh, pleadings of righteous women, that happens in verse 19 of chapter 18, and it doesn't make a difference. Uh, there's there's the idea that revelation is gone from them because the Leahona stops working for them. They're receiving no guidance from the Lord, but Nephi is going to receive guidance when, when he's released. And you have the idea of that natural disaster. Just, it, it, it you know, they untie Nephi, but that doesn't have a lasting effect. I just see for Laman Lemuel's entire life in First Nephi, God consistently reaching out, reaching out. And I think he does that for us too. And then Nephi, I, I'm just picturing him. He's now in the promised land. And we're what, about 30 years later. And what's going on in his life? You have a time where things are rough. You've got Laman and Lemuel and they're, they're, you could say they're two distinct camps. I, I can just picture the, the the strain in the relationships. And he says, you know what? I want to be able to share with you, now this is 19 verse 7, what I find is just of great worth to the body and the soul. And then he shares prophecies of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the scattering of the Jews. And then verse 19 or in chapter 19, verse 15, he relates many things that the Jews will suffer until the times it com comes a time again when they will no more turn aside their hearts against the Holy One of Israel. Then he will remember the covenants which he had made to their fathers. And in verse 18, Nephi relates to his people all this that perhaps I might persuade them that they would remember the Lord, their Redeemer. And to more fully persuade them, he's like, I got, I got my favorite prophet. I'm going to read Isaiah to you. For Nephi, one of the reasons he quotes Isaiah is the promise that you can have hope. For after this manner has the prophet written. For me, when I read Isaiah, that is one of the major themes I look for. Because Nephi points out, Isaiah is living in a time when you have the Assyrian Empire that's threatening that kind of a physical attack. He's in a time when there's spiritual destruction, a spiritual just I don't know. They're, they're that spirituality. I could picture him that he needs a little hope, and he's writing to bolster up the saints of that day. There's a song that you know that I've related before that when I was a teenager came out. That is maybe a little bit of lack of of hope, and it's a song by REM. You know, and, and here's the lyrics. That's me in the corner. That's me in the spotlight, losing my religion trying to keep up with you, and I don't know if I can do it. Oh, no, I've said too much. <laughs> I haven't said enough. I thought that I heard you laughing. I thought that I heard you sing. I thought, I thought you, I saw you try, but that's just a dream. Try? Cry? Why try? That was just a dream. And I thought about, you know, Christianity today. Uh, it, it, whichever group of Christians you are, there seems to be a little bit of a of a falling away now. And this is from a little while ago that, 
you know, an influencer in Christianity just says, hey, what, what's happening? We're, we're listening maybe more to uh, 20-year-old worship singers than maybe we are to God's Word. And I just kind of tied that time into what Nephi is experiencing and how this is so relevant to us today. Nephi is facing a family where some of them are walking away or just about to, Laman and Lemuel, they're losing their religion. And Nephi's got, you know, I need some hope. My family needs hope. Let me quote Isaiah. And what is the words of Isaiah going to help when a family seems to be torn apart? And how do you help somebody who's maybe losing their religion? So here's what Nephi does. That's this kind of circumstance he's in when he chooses to quote this. I'm going to do it. Let me just read the verses to you of what he reasons why he quotes Isaiah. Chapter 19, verse 23. And I had read many things unto them which were written in the books of Moses. But that I might more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord the Redeemer, I did read unto them that which was written by the prophet Isaiah. For I did liken all scriptures unto us, that it might be for our prophet and Isaiah, uh, prophet and learning. Wherefore, I did speak unto them, saying, Hear the words of the prophet, whom ye are a remnant of the house of Israel, a branch who have been broken off. Hear ye the words of the prophet, which were written unto all the house of Israel. And, hey, liken them to yourselves. Compare what Isaiah is writing to you. That, here's a result. You compare this, you compare what he's writing to our lives today, that you can have hope. As well as your brethren from whom you've been broken off. It's not just them that needed hope, it's you who need hope today. For after this manner is a prophet written. I have found the words of Isaiah give hope. And they're for our profit and our learning. And they more fully persuade us to believe in the Lord our Redeemer. So Isaiah is going to quote, or Nephi is going to quote Isaiah chapter 47, which talks about the failures of Babylon. And Isaiah chapter 48, which is the failures of Israel. And he's pointing out, here's the hope. All these things that, are God, that God has done for you and is doing for you to overcome the failures associated with the world and your failures. And so here's just kind of chapter 20 in a summary with just one theme, that you may have hope. There is hope in verse 1 where he talks about the waters that where you're baptized, covenants. We have hope and strength as we get bap, uh, covenants. Verses 2 and 3, we can have hope because God, Nephi talks about God knows the future and he knows us. And verse 9, he's not going to cut us off. I love verse 10, for behold, I, God is saying, have refined thee. I know that's been required a little bit of heat, maybe a little bit of pressure, but I'm taking those things and I know who you are, I know the things I need to get out of your life and refine you. Verse 20, I have chosen thee in the, in the furnace of affliction. I know you have trials, but I'm having these trials with you to maybe help you purge you, get rid of some of those things that are not pure. So, fourth thing, God chooses and refines us in the furnace of affliction. And that gives us hope because we're being refined to kind of see that view as God sees it. And verse 18, Oh, that thou had hearkened to my commandments, then thy peace had been as a river. I love that imagery. There is hope that when we listen to the commandments of God, that peace, I just, I just think of that river flowing, it's continuous. When we're keeping the commandments, God's peace can continually flow to us. It can continually be refreshing coming from God. And Nephi has just had that chapter 11 experience where he's seen God's vision. And he's like, hey, the foundation, the fountain of these, these living waters is the love of God. Your peace, can you can feel that love of God in your heart. And the end of verse 20, thy righteousness will be like waves of the sea, always coming in, always having effect always powerful if you can see it. So a five, hearkening to God brings a river of peace. Hearkening to God, listening and obeying God brings waves of righteousness to you. And just summarizing verse 20, we can, we can, we can be in Babylon, we can be around it, but we can still sing the songs of redeeming joy. And the realization in verse 21, to have hope, Isaiah says, God is able to do miracles in our lives. And now verse 22, God reminds, and notwithstanding all these done, all these, all these miracles, and greater also, 
God's not just going to do that, but he can do even greater things. There is no peace, saith the Lord, to the wicked. And this is just one of my cross-references, because I love chapter 32, verse 17. The work of the righteous, Isaiah says, shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. That word assurance in Hebrew could be translated as hope forever. And, and here's just my, my paragraph from, uh, from my, uh, I, my book, A Prophet's Prophet. There's no pre peace in wickedness. There never has been. There never will be. In Isaiah 32, 17, Isaiah taught the work of righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. The Lord, the Lord also said to Joseph Smith, but learn that he who doth the works of righteousness shall receive his reward, even peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. So not only is God able to do miracles in our life, but he just teaches that hey, God's done all these things for us and he's going to do greater also that you can have hope. But in chapter 20 and 21, that there's some complaints that are given. And I'm going to go back to a few years ago. My high school, we have kind of like this uh, social media site where some of us post things not very often. And and honestly, I don't look very often, but I, I do sometimes. I kind of catch up on some of the people that I know. And a few years ago, one of my classmates wrote, does anybody remember me? I wish I could hear from you. I feel all alone, and nobody calls me or texts me. Oh, it was so comforting. I had members of my class, and I'm seeing this months later, and they're just like, I remember you. I remember you. I, I, I had such good classmates in high school, and they're so, so thoughtful now. But it's been reported the rates of loneliness have doubled over the past 15 years. Now, this is kind of a more recent loneliness in the United States, just kind of study. 52% of Americans report feeling lonely. 47% of Americans report their relationships with others are not meaningful. And whether you're single or not, 57% of Americans report eating all meals alone. So Isaiah, as a part of this, gives hope for those who feel, in, like in chapter 49, I'm quoting this from Isaiah 49, 14. Okay, Zion hath said, the Lord hath forsaken me, the Lord, my Lord hath has forgotten me. Isaiah gives hope for those who may feel forgotten. There's another complaint I, that, that Israel has in Isaiah 49 that, that Nephi quotes. Then thou shalt say in thy heart, who has, who has begotten me? Seeing I have lost my children, I am desolate. And moving to and fro, who hath brought up these? For I was left alone. Where had they been? I'm going through these difficult things. I've lost children. Where were you? I feel alone. Isaiah gives hope for the lonely. Because Isaiah is making some replies here. Okay? And, verse 24, the sign of third complaint. Hey, shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? This isn't just a captive, someone who's thrown in, you know, he's just like, hey, uh, someone came out and kidnapped me. It's the lawful captive. They're in jail. Maybe they're in jail for a reason. And Isaiah is saying, Lord's saying through Isaiah, I'm going to give you some hope for people who are captive. Maybe it's captive because it's not of your fault, but maybe you're captive because of your fault. Something that you did that brought in captivity. I'm going to come back to this, but maybe just think about something like an addiction. Maybe there were some things that you did right up front, and now you can't escape it. Okay, for whatever reason, Isaiah starts saying, let me just tell you how I'm going to give you hope. And that's the next chapter. Here are some things that Isaiah gives hopes, hope to the forgotten, the lonely, and the captive. First thing, he talks about his servant. Okay, hope comes through his servant. Chapter 21, now back to Nephi, him quoting Isaiah. Verse 3, it comes through my servant. Number one, here's some attributes about servants, of servants of God. They're foreordained to do what they're doing. They're prepared for a purpose, verse 2, and they invite others to spiritually return to God, verse 5. There is an emphasis of servants of God that you need to have that personal relationship with God, and they give inspired counsel. Hope also comes through the servant of God, or the servants of God, as they gather Israel, verse 5. That's verse 5. Hey, we're going to gather Israel, and you're going to have hope to do that. 
for the Lord, the gathering of Israel is a small matter. It's not a big deal to him. You may think, oh, this is a big deal. But for him, it's a small matter. Nothing's too hard for the Lord, for any, for him or any of the servant he sent who has faith in him. Verse 6 of chapter 21. There's hope through the servants because they're able to guide us to the light in our day. It's kind of like Matthew 5, 14 through 16. It's not just Christ as the light of the world, but ye are the light of the world. These servants are asked to be, whatever the, whoever the servant is, if you're a servant of God and you're being inspired of him, you're asked to be a light to the world and to those around you. There also comes hope through the servant, because at the appointed time, this is verse 8, God will help and prepare and give his servant a covenant, and a covenant for the people, and there is hope through covenants. The servant will be able to establish to the earth or restore the ability of people from the whole earth to make and keep a covenant with God. The servant, as Isaiah teaches, is going to enable those who are in darkness to see the light. You also got similar wording in Isaiah 47, verse 42, verse 7. Prophet Joseph Smith explained that those who sit in darkness are those who in prison refer to the spirits of the dead who are bound in spirit prison, like or hell. And God is going to be able to enable them to get out of that prison. Nothing's too hard for God. God will provide help, verses 9 through 11, for all their needs. It includes the gathering. He's going to comfort them, verse 13. So you may say, okay, back to the original thing. Uh, has God forgotten you? Has God forgotten us? Isaiah gives us these wonderful three verses. And I'm quoting it from Isaiah here. But Zion has said, the Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of, of her womb? Okay, is that possible? He's like, yay, yeah. They may forget. Not likely. But they may, yet I will not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee in the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Every time I'm looking, I got reminders that I can do this. I remember you. I have not forsaken you. Thy walls, and maybe sometimes it's two ways, because walls can be a protection. The ways that things that protect you are continually before me, I know how to protect you. Or maybe the walls are the barriers that you need to overcome in life. I know what the barriers are between you and what, you're, what, what you want. They're continually before me. I have not forgotten what they are or you. Elder uh, Renlon said, Jehovah asked, For can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? As unlikely as it is that loving mother would forget her infant child, Jehovah declared that his devotion was even more steadfast. He affirmed, Yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. Behold, I have engraven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Because Jesus Christ endured the infinite atoning sacrifice, he emphasizes, uh, he empathizes perfectly with us. He is always aware of us and our circumstances. Back to Israel's second question. Maybe we ask it, hey, has God left us alone? Isaiah's inspired reply that Nephi quotes, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up a standard to the people, and shall bring their son, bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. That standard is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It is a prophecy that one day God would raise it as an ensign, a standard to the people. He's not left us alone because he's organ made an organization that's design. Its whole design is to bring us to him. Okay, and I, I just love that imagery. And the third question, can God free the captive? Not just the captive that are because they were, you know, someone going out and grabbed them, but maybe the captive that are maybe of a little of their own doing. Verse 24, shall the prey be taken from the mighty? They've been kidnapped or whatever the reason, right? Or the lawful captive. They're in prison because it's lawfully. They violated the law. Thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered, for I will contend with them that contend with thee. 
I will save. It's not just thee. I'm fighting your battles, but I'm going to save your children. And I'll feed them that press thee with their own flesh. They'll be drunken with their own blood. Sweet wine, and all flesh shall know. I am the Lord. I am the Savior. I'm your Redeemer. I'm the Mighty One of Israel. Today, this chapter is being fulfilled all around us. I love the way Pro, the, uh, Wilford Woodruff said this. He said, The revelations that are in the Bible, the predictions of the patriarchs and the prophets, who saw by vision and revelation the last dispensation of fullness of times, plainly tell us what is coming to pass. The 49th chapter of Isaiah, as we just quoted, we talked about in 1 Nephi chapter 21, is having its fulfillment. I know that Isaiah, when you read it, can give us hope for the forgotten, the lonely, the captive. And that includes you know, a prisoner maybe of our own doing, whether maybe it's an addiction or, or a habit. God can help us overcome that. And the Nephi makes some great commentary. His last chapter of our study today, hey, let me just emphasize a few things that's going to help you with hope. Because I'm writing to you in our day, not just with, with what Isaiah's words, but maybe this can help you give a little hope and overcome your fears about living in the last days. And so I'm going to go through the chapter 22, kind of a little summary, and just listen to what he repeats. Because if you want to know what some of the things that, that's important to you, important to God or important maybe your parents, listen to what they repeat. So God will not suffer, the wicked shall destroy the righteousness. And then verse 17, God will preserve the righteous by his power. You may think things are going wrong, but God has power to deliver you and preserve you. And verse 17, the righteous need not fear. Verse 19, the righteous, you're not going to perish. It kind of sounds like there's some tough times that we go through. And then, well, then Nephi teaches kind of again, the Lord, verse 20, will surely prepare a way for his people. Kind of echoing back to chapter 3, verse 7. I know the Lord's, you go and do, the Lord will prepare a way. Trust him. And then verse 20, he says, Hear Christ in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you. Whatever he's saying, listen to him, hearken to him. And then another reminder, the righteous need not fear. The righteous must be led up, he says, and the Holy One of Israel must reign. It's coming. He's leading you. The millennium's coming. He will reign. God will gather his children and number his sheep, and they will know him, is the promise in verse 25. And there will come a time, Nephi promises, his people will dwell in righteous. And you may think, who is the righteous? Nephi defines it, the last part of this chapter. For him, he defines the righteous, in verse 28, as those who turn back to God, who repent, who are obedient to the commandments of the God, and then he adds, those who endure to the end. I think it's a marvelous thing that people are on the path. They do so much as they're going through so many difficulties in life. I want to conclude with a quote from President Brigham Young as just a reminder that, you know, we may be going through a lot, but it's just amazing how well we're doing. So this really stood out to me as in my study this week. President Brigham Young said, there are ten thousands of temptations to sail. And you might make a miss here and slip there and may say you've not lived up to all the knowledge you have. True. But often, it is a marvel to me that you've lived up to so much as you have, considering the power of the enemy upon the earth. Few have ever lived, have fully understood that power. I do not fully comprehend the awful power and influence Satan has upon the earth, but I understand enough to know that it is a marvel that the Latter-day Saints are as good as they are. Hey, thanks for spending some time with me. I'd love to hear your thoughts and suggestions. If you want to add it to, to YouTube, just uh, with the video, what you thought. Uh, I appreciate uh, the comments and, and a couple of the questions as well. If you want to reach out to me on on X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, I am it's at Bro Miller's Notes. And just a reminder, if you want to go ahead, I'm trying to do these videos kind of in a timeline that's right the Sunday before we start the, vid, um, the study. If you want to see mine from four years ago, uh, if you want to study ahead, they're at brothermiller.org. Hey, thanks for spending some time with me. I hope you have a lovely day. Keep smiling.